Good morning and good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues in Russia and in other countries of the world. Uh, I hope that you can uh, hear me well. And please, in case of any uh, disruptances, uh, you can type in the chat and we will try to react immediately. Uh, I do remind that uh, this is a continuation of our ASEAN Academic Days uh, lectures and talks dedicated to the most uh, hot and pressing issues which resonate uh, both to ASEAN and Russia. And today our speaker is Dr. Jitipat Pungham from Tamasat University in Thailand. So uh, greetings Dr. Uh, Jitipat Pungham. We are very happy to have you with us. Uh, and uh, we have a very wide registration. The, uh, not all the registered uh, have appeared yet. I think that uh, on the course of the events we will see more, um, more participants and more uh, questions. Uh, but so far I uh, should say that uh, we have registration from Russia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Singapore, Vietnam, South Africa, Italy. So uh, you see, Dr. Punham, how interesting and uh, really vibrant uh, the topic you proposed is. Uh, our today talk is about Pax Indo-Pacifica, a struggle for regional power and prestige. And uh, we have already uh, received a number of questions, uh, which I hope we will be able to discuss after, uh, after your talk, uh, Jitipat. Uh, I will briefly remind about our house rules. Uh, day participants, please uh, remain muted during the uh, speaker's talk. And if you wish to uh, pose a question, please send me a note to chat and identify yourself, your name and uh, your institution or university, uh, so uh, we could pro uh, probably introduce uh, you during the Q&A uh, um, talks, uh, Q&A discussions. Uh, of course, the topic is uh, indeed important, and uh, it is getting more important with, uh, well, the recent election process uh, in the United States. So uh, let's see what uh, will be coming out of the Indo-Pacific strategy during the next uh, presidential term uh, in America. But I would like to start with a question which we received from Dr. Yelena Kutavaya from the Moscow State University from the Institute of Asian and African Studies. What is ASEAN place in Pax Indo-Pacifica? Uh, we in Russia also would uh, probably question what would be a Russian place in Pax Indo-Pacifica if it ever you know, uh, embodies in, uh, in, something, um, in something institutionalized or settled. So uh, with this provocative questions, let me pass the floor to Dr. Punham for his, for his talk and his points. Thank you, please. Thank you, Ekaterina, for, for your kind word um, and also questions from, from friends and colleagues. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for having me with uh, MGMO today. Uh, good morning and good, good evening, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so the, today's topic is, is very interesting, uh, in particular in our um, interesting time. Uh, but first thing first, let, let me um, share you with uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Right, so here we go. Um, so the Indo-Pacific is uh, a very contested term uh, used in international relations uh, describing a broader uh, space covering the intersection of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. However, uh, different actors interpret the Indo-Pacific uh, differently. Until very recently, uh, there are at least uh, eight distinctive uh, strategic visions endorsing uh, the concept of the Indo-Pacific region. Since um, Germany has released um, the latest version of uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy um, in September this year, which followed the likes of um, Australia, uh, France, India, uh, Japan, the US, uh, ASEAN, and Taiwan. This strategic uh, difference reflects on the one hand, uh, the region's glowing and economic, um, growing economic and strategic importance within the uh, rapidly changing international uh, arena. 
And on the other hand, the heightened and intense geopolitical competition uh, in the expanding Indo-Pacific region. One of the key um, geopolitical interpretations is the American one, which is the, you know, the dominant narrative of Donald Trump's foreign policy. And we now know that whoever uh, wins the US presidential elections, either um, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and inaugurates the term uh, on January 20th, uh, 2021. I agree, argue that the core substance of the US grand strategy, especially Pax Indo-Pacifica, will be the same, although Biden might rename the strategic vision. That is, the ultimate aims of the US is to maintain uh, the preponderance of power and prestige in global politics and to avoid any power shift unfavorable to its dominance. For the US, um, Pax Indo-Pacifica is a search uh, for a zone of peace um, led by the US and the so-called Quad, comprising the other three like-minded democracies of Japan, India, and Australia. In Indo-Pacific region, based on you know, liberal principles, uh, such as democracy, liberal economy, and freedom of navigation, and so on and so forth. Uh, in Delhi, very recently, um, Deputy U.S. Secretary of State uh, Stephen Began uh, coined the term Pax uh, Indo-Pacifica to, um, to conceptualize a region at peace, protect and made prosperous in equal measure by those who comprise the Indo-Pacific. He also called it for a stronger quad uh, to court. Quad is a partnership driven by shared interests, not binding obligations, and is, intent, and is not intended to be an exclusive uh, grouping. Any country that seeks a free and open Indo-Pacific and is willing to, to, steps, uh, to take steps to ensure that should be welcome to work with us, end quote. So according to Began, uh, Quad represents an anchor in an Indo-Pacific region buffeted by changing winds and shifting currents, especially uh, China's military assertiveness and the prospect of power transition. Uh, my argument today is that uh, Pax Indo-Pacifica as an American construct is aimed at a struggle for power and prestige in the region amidst the emerging bipolar uh, international society. However, the success and resilience of stable and peaceful Indo-Pacific no longer requires the intense geopolitical competition between great powers, but rather need to need a region, regional rule of the game that is more inclusive, rule following, and positive sum, which is beneficial to all rather than a zero sum game. So my talk will, will consist of three main parts uh, as follows. The first part examines how the American version of Indo-Pacific strategy come about and uh, consists of. The second part, uh, which might answer um, uh, the question uh, asked by our friend, discuss how ASEAN responds to Pax Indo-Pacifica. So I said that um, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific is an example or manifestation of what I call uh, leading from the middle strategy. The third part uh, asks how uh, Pax Indo-Pacifica will come about, uh, will come apart in the near future, especially um, in the recently signed ASEP or Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership. I will provide us uh, with some possible or likely trajectories or scenarios. So let's start with the first part. Um, I think the US uh, conception of Indo-Pacific emerged around 2017, when Donald Trump first officially uh, announced it in a speech at the APEC summit in Da Nang, Vietnam in December uh, that year. It is broadly conceived as an effort to defend freedom and openness in the rules based order in concerted with willing partners. 
The rising and assertive China has become a central concern uh, of these emerging free and open Indo-Pacific strategies. So since then, the term Indo-Pacific has replaced the Asia-Pacific uh, throughout uh, you know, American and others' strategic vocabularies. The US Pacific Command, for example, uh, is subsequently renamed uh, the Indo-Pacific Command in May uh, 2018. Uh, key uh, characteristics of the American version of Indo-Pacific strategy as follows. First, it is a policy response to the so-called existential risk uh, for American interests. The risk that existentially affected the identity and status of the unipolar power. So the US under Donald Trump saw the assertive uh, Chinese power as an existential threat to its vital interests. I think it is not purely the changing configuration of material power that, that shape packs uh, Indo-Pacifica, but more importantly, uh, the lingering anxiety, uh, especially discursive anxiety, that render um, the old narrative quite impossible or untenable. During the um, discursive anxiety, great power will search for new narrative or discourse in order to make sense of the world in general and its own status within the changing power transition. So the Indo-Pacific strategy then is uh, the new narrative, the American uh, new narrative in order to cope with anxiety emerging from the structural transformation of global politics. Second, the Indo-Pacific strategy is a strategic shift from counter-terrorism towards a great power competition. So by, um, since uh, 2017 onwards, great power competition, in particular in the Indo-Pacific region, replaced war on terror as the first priority in US national uh, security. For example, um, in 2019, the US Department of Defense released an, in, an Indo-Pacific strategy report, which characterized uh, the Indo-Pacific as uh, America's primary uh, theater, spanning a vast uh, stretch of the globe from the west coast of the US to the western shores uh, in India. Third, the US Indo-Pacific um, strategy envision uh, international order in, in terms of a clash of two orders, okay? Uh, Trump's US uh, national security uh, strategy uh, published in December 2017 outlined the normative ideological differences uh, underlying uh, US Sino um, competition, stating that the key challenge in the Indo Pacific was, and I quote, a geopolitical competition between free and repressive visions of world order, end quote. Therefore, the US Indo Pacific strategy highlights the reality of an emerging bipolar world order in double sense. On the one hand, it is a geopolitical competition between the US and China. On the other hand, the uh, nascent bipolar world order is an ideational clash between two visions of global order, rule-based international order on the one hand and uh, neo-Westphalian international order led by China, which uh, promotes and protects uh, sovereignty, non-interference and pluralistic uh, international society. Fourth, the US Indo-Pacific strategy perceived it, um, China as a uh, strategic competitor and subsequently uh, a threat to the US vital interests. The White House uh, National Security Strategy and the Pentagon's National Defense Strategy identified China as a revisionist competitor that posed uh, th a threat to American interests around the world. The NSS uh, report or strategy it described how China seek to displace the US in the Indo-Pacific regions, uh, expand the reaches of its uh, state-driven economic model, 
and reorder the region in its favor. Fifth, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, fundamentally aimed at, at maintaining the preponderance of US power and prestige in the world. In, an, in a new era of great power competition, the US pledge to remain strategically engaged in the Indo-Pacific. The US needs um, the will and capab capabilities to combat and prevent unfavorable shift in the Indo-Pacific. Sixth, the Indo-Pacific strategy for the US is a military-oriented approach with double aims, with the, the double aims of uh, strengthening American military power uh, in the Indo-Pacific and rebuilding its new, newly established hub and spokes system in the region. One, the quad or quadrilateral security uh, dialogue is central to a minilateral uh, defense arrangement between four powers in the region, including the uh, US, Japan, India, and Australia. Second, the US has also strengthened uh, security ties with like-minded uh, China concerned nations under the alliance system in the region. Indo-Pacific military exercises continue, uh, such as the trilateral and nowadays uh, quadrilateral uh, Malabar exercises. Third, the US also steps up its uh, own forward military deployments in the Western Pacific and continues robust uh, freedom of navigation uh, or if or end exercise it in the South China Sea, which has become more routine during the Donald Trump administration. So all in all, uh, the American version or menu of Indo-Pacific is part and parcel of a broader so-called Trump doctrine of America first. The latter uh, consists of the foreign policy of unilateralism abroad, political economy of protectionism culminated in uh, trade wars, as well as a struggle for technological supremacy, uh, such as those in the 5G network system, the control of access to semiconductors, and the banning of Huawei. In the second part, I will discuss how the increasingly intense geopolitical rivalry between the US and China has set the ambiguous and ambivalent context for these uh, for the small and medium powers in the region. So in this sense, it constitutes uh, a lingering anxiety, especially you know, discursive anxiety for uh, our Southeast Asian uh, nations and ASEAN as a regional grouping. So my focus today specifically examines how ASEAN uh, envisions and responds to an emerging uh, Pax Indo-Pacifica through the promulgation of ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific or AOIP. So even though uh, different uh, Southeast Asian states have pursued different strategies and tactics. So conceptually, I think um, actors in IR or global politics um, try to navigate the changing configuration of power uh, in at least uh, four ways or ideal types, okay? Balancing, soft balancing, band bargaining, and hedging. First, balancing is the traditional strategy in which uh, weaker power uh, develops its own military capabilities and form alliance system or strategic partnership in order to constrain the rising power that can become a potential uh, danger or threat. Second, Soft, uh, soft balancing is a strategy that weaker power, uh, acknowledging the increasingly military might of rising power and the high risk of military confrontation, instead uses the non-military instruments uh, such as uh, in international institution, uh, diplomatic coalitions and economic sanctions to restrain the rising power. Third, band bargaining is a strategy that weaker power seeks survival and security by engaging and aligning with uh, the source of potential danger, such as the rising and assertive power. Fourth, hedging, uh, which seem to be um, a standard of uh, foreign policy practices nowadays, 
um, in ASEAN and in East Asia in general. It's a mix uh, or combined strategy of balancing and band bargaining. It seems that every state prefers to hedge while maintaining uh, military ties with the US. Uh, it's engaged with uh, the PRC and Russia uh, economically in increasingly uh, concentrated ways. I would like to initiate the fifth option or ideal type, namely the leading from the middle strategy. Leading from the middle strategy is a combination of hedging and collective uh, comprehensive security strategy. It is defined as a strategic vision that a small or middle uh, power pursues in order to hedge with the great powers by them within a rule or norm-based order, regional order in particular, while simultaneously um, initiating uh, region-wide uh, innovations and advocacy. The strategic aim at seeking to reduce uh, uncertainty or anxiety for small and middle powers amid great power rivalries. In this sense, uh, leading from the middle strategy reinforces um, hedging's more positive attributes by strengthening the bargaining leverage for a group of middle, uh, middle powers, such as ASEAN, to compel the US and China to respect its own interests, and in the long term, to avoid uh, succumbing to the temptation of uh, balancing or ban bargaining. So in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, I argue that the AOIP or ASEAN outlook in Indo-Pacific is a weak um, or initial, uh, initial manifestation of leading from the middle strategy. So in early 2018, uh, Indonesia, especially its foreign minister, uh, Retno uh, Masudi has initiated and present its own vision of Indo-Pacific. The Indo Indonesian version of Indo-Pacific is also driven by uh, President Joko Widodo's goal of turning Indonesia into a maritime uh, falcon or axis. The proposal was hotly debated and discussed at various uh, ASEAN me meetings and summits until it was accepted under Thailand's ASEAN chairmanship in 2019. The AOIP is adopted as an ASEAN um, guideline during the uh, 34th ASEAN summit in June in Bangkok. This year, under Vietnam's chairmanship 2020, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese uh, Prime Minister Nguyen Xuan Park described the AOIP as the foundation for the bloc to promote a Southeast Asian region of peace, uh, security, neutrality, and stability, and to increase values to its regional peace in line with um, international law. Despite its relatively weak and broad guideline, AOIP has some interesting characteristics as follows. First, ASEAN has positioned itself as a centrality in regional cooperation and peaceful settlement and resolution of conflict. ASEAN centrality ensures that uh, this regional um, grouping requires centrally embr embedded in all regional schemes and could engage outside powers. Second, ASEAN has asserted that regional uh, architectures should be based on existing international institutional uh, frameworks and arrangements to cope with regional challenges, such as the pandemic, uh, environmental issues, and so on and so forth. So basing on the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, or TAC, ASEAN highlights the significance of ASEAN-based institutions, such as uh, East Asia Summit, EAS, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF, ASEAN Defense Minister uh, meetings or ADMM plus and so on and so forth. Third, ASEAN version of Indo-Pacific is more inclusive. It does neither build or an exclusive block nor put um, no restrictions on the entry of players 
in particular outside uh, powers. Rather, ASEAN continues to play a role of bridge builder, linking all major powers uh, through ASEAN-centric uh, institutions. Fourth, AOIP has implicitly recognized the diversity and pluralism of political regimes in the Indo-Pacific region. Rather than the American versions of Indo-Pacific free and open Indo-Pacific, ASEAN emphasized the ASEAN way, the coexistence, the, the consensus building diplomacy and the coexistence between different ideas, uh, values and regimes. Fifth, ASEAN has not directly addressed Sino-American geopolitical competition. Uh, and I think this is a good starting point. This is because of ASEAN's reluctance uh, to oppose China and Russia to a lesser extent, and its preference to hedging strategy. ASEAN has sought to avoid trapping in the pitfalls of great power competition and to attract foreign trade, investment, and funding from all major countries. Last but not least, ASEAN has highlighted a more comprehensive and non-traditional challenges to the region, in particular four main areas of cooperation, including maritime security, connectivity, uh, sustainable development, and economic cooperation, among other things. These regional challenges require the urgency of region-wide cooperation and integration. In brief, ASEAN-centric vision of Indo-Pacific um, has been often criticized that ASEAN is a latecomer, ASEAN uh, outlook is merely a tiger paper without common position. However, we can say that AOIP illustrates a good starting point for thinking and rethinking the Indo-Pacific as an inclusive, non-confrontational, and consensus building region. What ASEAN needs is how to navigate its position and step up the leadership and institutional strength that could possibly constrain the repercussion of Sino-US strategic contest for power and prestige. And by doing so, ASEAN could lead from the middle. I would like to conclude uh, the talk by offering some thoughts on the likely trajectories or scenarios of Pac Indo Pacifica in the com coming decades of the 21st century as the US uh, seek power and prestige in an increasingly turbulent world. The first tendence, uh, tentative scenario is that the expanding and vibrant Indo Pacific region will remain the key strategic focus of the US in the years or decades to come. Although the new American president might change the name, the contents of Pax Indo-Pacifica will remain intact. In particular, the ultimate aims of maintenance of American hegemonic power, the avoidance of uh, Chinese century, and the strengthening of alliance system in the Indo-Pacific region. The second scenario is that um, the world is approaching uh, an emerging um, bipolar world, which seem to be inevitable in the near future. This world order is based on some key components. First, it is a geopolitical contest for global and regional supremacy, especially between the two superpowers, the US on the one hand and China slash Russia on the other hand. Second, it is a clash of two visions of world order, liberalism and uh, nationalism. This is an ideational, if not ideological struggle for power and prestige. Third, this bipolar world uh, will be based on a struggle for technological supremacy, especially in cyberspace and 5G network. The third scenario is that the ultimate aim of maintaining the American preponderance of power and prestige 
in the world and the Indo and, and in the Indo-Pacific region in particular, is quite difficult, if not impossible, to maintain in the age of you know, multipolar and multiplex world. Following Bruce uh, Bill Jenderson's apart a drop amidst model of different eras in US foreign policy, I think that it is quite certain that the US will not be apart or isolate itself from global politics next year onwards. However, American power will be juggling between a top and a mid international society, given the changing uh, context of power transition and rising global uh, challenges and risks. The last but not least likely scenario is that the stakes for small and middle powers, in particular ASEAN in the bipolar uh, world order, are much higher nowadays. In the long run, hedging is not sufficient and sustainable. This is because increasing uh, geopolitical rivalry between the US and China, especially uh, struggle for trade wars, technological supremacy, and security tensions uh, in the resource-rich uh, South China Sea would eventually force the regional players to shoot sides. That outcome of shooting, choosing sides would seem largely unavoidable if more zero-sum approaches were pursued without modification. Hedging alone and by itself increase the potential of the so-called two cities trap, precipitating uh, the conflict and tension between the rising and declining powers. Also, Indo-Pacific concept does not merely aim at that um, called counter, countering China's assertiveness, but highlight India as a key player in the region. The scenario that the ASEP or regional um, comprehensive economic uh, partnership without India seems to, uh, seem to be a challenge to the region and to dampen the economic prospect. The key challenge for ASEAN is how to mitigate India's exit and exclusion from the ASEAN and link India and other players in the regional supply chain of trade and investment amid the ongoing pandemic crisis. My last words is that a stable, secure, and sustainable Pact Indo-Pacifica requires new thinking and new practices in foreign policy. I argue that the leading from uh, the middle strategy might be one of the sustainable options for the small and middle powers in the Indo-Pacific region. AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, is a manifestation of this strategy, although so far it is not yet um, substantiated and requires a more nuanced uh, leadership and institutional rearrangement in the emerging bipolar world order. Thank you. Dr. Punkham, for your very um, illuminating talk, I would say, because we all uh, now talk about Indo-Pacific. We all uh, focus on this uh, issue, but uh, there are many, many questions coming out of it. How to react to it, how to deal with uh, what you uh, named as eight now visions of the Indo-Pacific, how to reconcile them, how to find the proper place in them. Uh, I have... Uh, many, many uh, questions uh, personally to, to you and uh, to this provocative topic, but uh, let me start with uh, giving a floor to our participants. In advance, we have already collected a number of uh, questions, and let me uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Tamirlan Gajiev uh, from the Moscow State University, because his question directly relates to what you have just said. Uh, Tamirlan, uh, please uh, unmute your mic and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, uh, my question is, um, 
you know, today we have <coughs> generally uh, two uh, visions on future global order. I mean, Belt and Road Initiative from China and Pax in the Pacifica from uh, <coughs> America. So the question is, is it possible for Asian uh, countries to participate uh, both uh, in Belt and Road Initiative and uh, <coughs> in Pax uh, in the Pacifica, and which is uh, much more beneficial for Asian countries? Thank you. Please. Thank, thank you. Um, I think there's very interesting questions and, and I think uh, it is possible and it is highly likely that ASEAN uh, would participate in both um, organizations, in both uh, institutional frameworks. Uh, and in that sense, I think that is, um, you know, that is uh, part of hedging strategy of ASEAN so far, okay? In a way that ASEAN try to engage uh, with both um, visions of global order, uh, and in particular, uh, two institutional frameworks. Uh, what I would like to argue is that ASEAN, uh, in order to, you know, uh, work sustainably in this, you know, uh, Sino-American uh, strategic rivalry and uh, intense geopolitical competition. I think what we need is to, to bind both superpowers into the uh, institutional arrangement of ASEAN itself, okay? So in this way, uh, two, two answers. One is it is highly possible for ASEAN to, to participate both uh, institutional frameworks. And at the same time, ASEAN might need, uh, you know, leadership uh, leading from the middle in order to uh, sustainably uh, survive and be prosperous in this uh, intense uh, geopolitical competition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamalon. and lecturer at the Department of IR at the University of Sri Lanka, Indonesia. So please, your uh, question next. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ajitipat, for, for the interesting presentation. My question is about the, the, the current situation regarding the US uh, presidential election. Uh, how do you see this, uh, this changing US presidency affecting mm. the situation uh, in the Pacific, especially with the, regarding the relation between the US and China and bring to bring Russia into this discussion. Where does uh, this US-China relation in the Pacific affects Russia and how, how do you think it will, it will play out in the future? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, many claim that, that um, the the difference between uh, Trump and Biden, okay, uh, will change uh, American foreign policy. I diverge from, from that common sense um, interpretation. I would say that uh, they share some similarity uh, despite that divergence of interest in, in global politics. Let, let me talk about the similarity between uh, Trump's and uh, Biden's foreign policy. Um, I think uh, the first similarity is that um, the ultimate aim of um, the U.S. Uh, in the world and in Indo-Pacific remain intact, namely uh, the maintenance of American preponderance of power, namely American hegemony, uh, status, sta uh, hegemonic status in, in global politics and try to avoid unfair power shift or transition in, in Indo-Pacific. That is, I think that, that would be the first similarity between Trump and uh, Biden, uh, whether who, whoever will, uh, will, will, will rule the US uh, in mid-January um, onwards. The second similarity is um, the American position uh, with, regard to, with regard to uh, China. Uh, I think, 
both uh, Trump and Biden envision China as a strategic competitor, uh, if not um, vital threat to American national interests. Okay. Uh, so if you look at um, you know Biden's speeches and um, and articles that he published recently in um, in the Foreign Affairs, I think uh, Biden. Uh, made specifically clear that one, uh, the US foreign policy, the US in particular, should uh, get tougher on China, okay? Second, he emphasized the united front of uh, democracies, liberal democracies uh, that need to uh, contain and constrain uh, military assertiveness of China uh, in Indo-Pacific and specifically in South China Sea. Uh, and so on. So I think at least these two um, policy stances uh, will, will, will dominate American foreign policy thinking and practices uh, in the years to come, uh, regardless of who will win the US presidential elections. Uh, let's talk about the divergence of interest a bit. Uh, I think um, Biden uh, will focus more on multilateralism in the region. Uh, in this sense, uh, the minilateral uh, or bilateral alliance system uh, might be secondary to the multilateral uh, institutional arrangement under um, uh, Biden. Okay, so I think that's the first one. The second difference might be about, uh, about uh, Biden's role and uh, position with regard to ASEAN, I think he would um, prefer closer, closer engagement with ASEAN okay, after the presidential election, okay, compared with Donald Trump's uh, you know, negligence of ASEAN and others, uh, you know, ASEAN-led uh, uh, multilateral summits and so on and so forth. So I think that, that uh, there are two divergences in particular with regard to Indo-Pacific. Um, how this um, has Indo-Pacifica uh, affect Russia uh, in the region? Uh, one thing I think uh, Russia has not yet um, has its own uh, take on Indo-Pacific concept, okay? But I think like China, Russia uh, interrogate or question the necessity of renaming uh, the Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific. Okay. In addition, I think for Russia um, and many actors such as China, Indo Pacific is an uh, ideologically different concept. Okay. In particular, uh, the concepts by uh, the like my uh, democracies in, in the region. Okay. If you think about US, Australian version, or uh, Japanese version, together with um, French and German versions. It comprised the idea of you know, um, ideological, uh, democratic, uh, democra democra democratically uh, oriented concept, okay? And second, I think uh, by taking Indo-Pacific into consideration, Russia play modest role in Asia Pacific and ASEAN right up until now. And I think uh, that is the role that ASEAN want to see from friends and uh, outside power. And I think that that is a key for, for Russia uh, so far. Last but not least, um, the Pax Indo-Pacifica has already strengthened military uh, alliance system in the region and also uh, economic bloc uh, which is uh, still ongoing, such as the uh, Indo-Pacific Business Forum, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? So in this way, um, I think there's a two uh, confrontation or two competition between two strategic regions in the region. Thanks also for a reminder that Russia should be more proactive uh, in the region. We will try to do our best. And uh, by the way, probably it's high time to have ASEAN-Russia discussions on the I 
possible IPR revision. Uh, but that's just uh, you know observations on the on the sidelines. Um, I hope that uh, Mr. Baktebek uh, Baturkanov uh, can ask his uh, question by voice. Uh, Baktebek, if you if you can unmute uh, your mic and uh, pose your question, could you please do that? Well, it seems that something doesn't work well. So let me pose this question uh, instead of uh, back to back. And uh, he wonders how can copyright the two organizations, Eurasian uh, Economic Union and uh, ASEAN question mark. It goes a little bit beyond the Indo-Pacific, I do uh, acknowledge. But uh, Jitipat, if you could share a couple of uh, th uh, thoughts on that, uh, we would very much welcome it. So Eurasian Economic Union and ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is another, um, you know, uh, cooperative prospect for, for ASEAN and also for bilateral uh, relations with uh, uh, Southeast Asian nations in general. Um, I think uh, right now um, ASEAN has uh, under negotiation with Russia and uh, Eurasian Economic Union in order to conclude the FTA free trade agreement between the two entities. Okay, uh, which in turn would, um, you know, broaden uh, the uh, trade uh, transactions, uh, more investments, and so on and so forth between the two uh, regions. Okay. Um, second, I think the second observation is that um, this ASEAN uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, would need or would see would need to see um, the success story of Vietnam uh, negotiation, complete negotiation with the Eurasian Economic Union. And I think uh, this is the agenda of uh, Vietnam's uh, ASEAN Championship uh, this year uh, in order to, to, to strengthen and facilitate um, the negotiation process of um, FTA between Eurasian Economic Union and ASEAN as a whole. Uh, with regard to this, I think uh, we need to highlight, this come to the third observation, is that I think we need to highlight areas of cooperation uh, and areas of um, maybe challenges, okay, between uh, ASEAN and uh, Eurasian Economic Union, okay. In terms of area of cooperation, I think in, in the realm of trade, uh, transaction, uh, lowering of uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers, uh, the agendas of promoting e-commerce and virtual online trade uh, and business matching uh, and so on and so forth. I think that there are, they cover you know, areas of um, you know, cooperation between these uh, two entities, okay? Uh, last but not least, I think in terms of size, uh, I think that is uh, the, strength and the potentiality between ASEAN and uh, Eurasian Economic Union as well, okay? Uh, with regard to uh, the area of challenges, I think about number one uh, is about the, um, you know, proximity, the geographic proximity or lack thereof, okay? Uh, and in this sense, it might be quite relatively quite uh, challenging for uh, ASEAN and also uh, Eurasian Economic Union to, to, to develop. The second uh, area of um, challenge might include uh, about how to standardize um, the uh, business uh, transactions and so on and so forth, okay? So I think that, that that's my take, uh, three observations on, on this, uh, but still uh, there, there is uh, a prospect of cooperation between ASEAN and Eurasian Economic Union, in my opinion.
There are two more questions uh, from the participants whom I cannot uh, identify in the list uh, of participants uh, who are now with us. Let me pose these questions in their stead. One uh, uh, was proposed by uh, Ms. Ludmila Katsuro from Moscow State University of International Relations, uh, and it deals with uh, the uh, ways to overcome the psychological barriers uh, between Russia and ASEAN members to achieve success at the multilateral level. Will Russia ever be able to have the same opportunity to leverage political and economic influence in Southeast Asia as the United States and China? And actually, Mr. Muhammad Hadi Dharma Ramadhani um, from Indonesia and uh, also an alumnus of National Research University High School of Economics in Moscow, uh, echoes this question uh, with uh, his statement, how is Russia's contribution to creating a balance of power in the Southeast Asian region might be? And is there any cooperation strategy between Russia and ASEAN to balance the power of China and the US in Southeast Asia? I think these two questions are very much close. If you could deal them in one package, that would be good. And meanwhile, I would like to remind all our participants that we still have some time. And if you have a question or a comment, please send me a message in chat so I could identify your wish to speak up. Thank you. So, uh, Djipat, please. Thank you for both questions. Um, I think uh, Professor Ludmila talked about um, the psychological barriers uh, that hinder uh, Russia's, um, you know, proactive um, engagement with, with the region uh, compared with uh, the U.S. Um, extended influence in, in the whole region. I think uh, we need to highlight a couple of factors uh, in, this, um, in this area. One is about um, the long uh, historical uh, context. Okay, I think the first factor is about long historical context, uh, in particular the Cold War uh, of um, you know ideological conflict and competition. Okay, so I think that that is the first thing about the image um, uh, dilemma, if you like, uh, the image dilemma in 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 the region as a whole. Okay, that still envision Russia from from that particular ideological uh, lens. The second point is about um, the uh, soft power uh, issue, okay? Uh, and I think um, Russia has uh, a very modest uh, soft power, um, projection of soft power in the region, okay? Uh, despite some, despite the fact that, uh, you know, a close cooperation in, you know, cultural uh, and lang linguistic uh, um, arenas, um, but in general, soft power has not gained uh, momentum in in the public opinion or public policy in general in in, in Southeast Asia or ASEAN uh, as a whole. Okay, so I think this is a second uh, uh, factor that uh, might contribute to the psychological barrier. Okay, and the third one I think is about the uh, economic, um, you know, the economic uh, uh, factor, namely um, a very modest, um, you know, number of trade and investment in the region. Uh, oh, I want to say that this is a is a question about Russian presence in in the region. Okay, uh, in terms of trade, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, you know, uh, engagement uh, with uh, regional um, institutions as well, okay? Um, so I think these three factors might explain the psychological barrier. And I think if, uh, if uh, Russia and the Russian government would like to, to strengthen and you know, facilitate the closer cooperation, these three um, factors need to be dealt with head on. Uh, the second question, uh, uh, Katerina, can, can you can you? The repeat second it one is more of the uh, geopolitical nature. Uh, is there any cooperation strategy between Russia and ASEAN, or whether it might be any cooperation strategy between Russia and ASEAN to balance the power of China and the U.S. in Southeast Asia? Mm -hmm. um, so, is there any um, strategies that Russia and South Southeast Asia uh, try to balance uh, China and um, 
and and the U.S. I think um, it's not quite clear cut here, but still, I think uh, if we, we look at this first, is about um, the roles of Russia's in in Vietnam, in particular the um, you know comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam, and also the military presence uh, together with the um, you know military to military. Uh, cooperation, closer cooperation in, in Vietnam might be uh, seen by uh, the American as uh, an attempt to balance uh, American power in the region, okay? Um, second, I think, uh, is, is a kind of uh, soft balancing strategy instead rather, rather than uh, the military balancing strategy, okay? I think uh, Russia together with uh, ASEAN country try to project uh, a kind of, you know, uh, Russian will, you know, um, soft power um, in the region, okay? But I think it's uh, still very modest, okay, uh, in, in the region. But uh, if we can see that as a soft balancing strategy, I think that that might be the case to look into it in, in further research. I think that uh, the very framework of strategic partnership between Russia and ASEAN might be utilized further, but of course there is a need to think better what, what can be the instruments at, and uh, mechanisms. I do not identify any further comments or questions, maybe some will be coming up. So I will use this opportunity to pose my personal question to Jetipat, because Jetipat, you represent the country uh, which was the one to uh, to organize the uh, uh, well, the proclamation of ASEAN outlook uh, of the Indo-Pacific region, because that was uh, in during uh, ASEAN summit in Thailand uh, when this outlook appeared. Uh, judging from now, from the present day. Uh, how would you say? How would you assess the uh, the progress in its implementation? Have ASEAN come up with? Uh, particular instruments, how to bring into life this, in my personal opinion, very inclusive and uh, uh, very wise approach to deal with this uh, kind of diversities. And then uh, Ksenia Yegorova sent me a question, a, a, an identification in chat that she would like to pose a question, and I will uh, give the floor to her after you deal with my question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Yekaterina. Um, I think um, so far, uh, there is no, I think so far there is no uh, concrete instruments uh, to substantiate um, the ASEAN outlook uh, on the Indo-Pacific. I think it's uh, ideas out there, okay? So the key challenge for ASEAN is how to implement those ideas into reality, okay? Uh, the second point, I think, is about um, the, the characteristic of ASEAN outlook itself. It's not a common policy, but rather the guideline on the Indo-Pacific. So compared with you know, other countries uh, that uh, endorse Indo-Pacific concept, okay, ASEAN uh, try to illustrate the you know, um, inclusive and ASEAN centrality as the key concepts in in, in the region. Uh, last but not least, I think um, we might not say directly that ASEAN uh, does not implement uh, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. This is partly or largely because ASEAN uh, emphasize uh, the Indo-Pacific or Pax Indo-Pacifica within the existing framework, uh, institutional framework of ASEAN. Okay, so in this way, uh, within the existing ASEAN frameworks, that that is the you know the function of uh, outlook for Indo-Pacific in general. Okay, so so in this way, uh, um, the key stance for ASEAN is to show that Indo-Pacific is not only open and free, but more importantly, inclusive and resilient to uh, friends uh, and alliance. Uh, around the world, in particular in, in this region in the world. Thank you. Let me now uh, ask Xenia to turn on her mic. Uh, she's a student uh, at the Universitas Pelita Harapan 
in Indonesia and a frequent participant in our talks, virtu virtually at least, and uh, hopefully we will meet in person in some time in the future. Xenia, please, could you ask your question? Hello. So my question is that taking into account the division within ASEAN, let's say Cambodia and Laos are under Beijing shadow, how this division might affect ASEAN centrality in the in the Pacific? Thank you. Hmm. So th thank you for, for your question. Um, so I think This is uh, the key puzzle for ASEAN, not only ASEAN outlook in Indo-Pacific, but uh, ASEAN as a regional grouping, as a regional institu institution from day one. And I think uh, the diversions of interest or division within ASEAN, such as uh, you know, uh, some countries uh, close alliance with, with China might uh, you know, uh, precipitate the uh, the lack of um, common position of ASEAN uh, on the Indo-Pacific. So I totally agree with you. That is uh, one of the uh, obstacle of, um, of, of ASEAN in general. But on the other hand, uh, that is the point of ASEAN, okay? Since day one, ASEAN is, uh, is a regional institution that try to you know, reach uh, common uh, position or common idea, true and why um, consensus building uh, mechanism. Okay, in particular, uh, ASEAN try to reach uh, consensus. Okay, in any policy stance. Okay, so and I think that is the second point that uh, ASEAN would would do that, but it takes time. But at the end, it is more um, you know consensus building. Uh, interest and uh, common uh, strategy of ASEAN in the wrong run, okay? Um, last but not least, I think uh, if we look at this divergence of uh, interest in ASEAN, okay? Um, but I think one, one of the key points of um, the foundation of ASEAN, okay? According to um, uh, Singapore's uh, first foreign minister, uh, Raja Ratnam has argued, okay? Uh, ASEAN has to feel the region's vacuum of power on its own. Otherwise, uh, it might resign itself to the dismal uh, prospect of vacuum being filled from outside. So I think that is a fundamental principle of ASEAN in terms of ASEAN way uh, of consensus and so on and so forth, okay? However, uh, it has um, obstacles in order to reach uh, consensus or consensus-based um, common position, in particular in the Indo-Pacific. So, dear friends, colleagues, are there any further questions, comments? I do not recognize any uh, immediate uh, reactions uh, from the audience so far. So, if, if we are exhausted at this moment, let me uh, please join me in thanking our today's speaker, Mr. Jitipat, for his very uh, sincere uh, sharing of his thoughts. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, several embassies in Moscow uh, joined us for uh, today's um, uh, academic uh, ASEAN Academic Days Lecture. Uh, in particular, I would like to welcome uh, the new ambassador of Malaysia, Dato Bala Chandran Tarman, and uh, His Excellency Primjit Sadiswan from the Singaporean Embassy, the, the ambassador of Singapore to Moscow. Uh, so, Mr. Jitipat Punkhan, thanks for sharing your ideas. Thanks for provoke, provoking food for uh, provoking questions, providing food for thought, and I hope that this is not our uh, last uh, talk in this uh, framework, and uh, we will have more opportunities to exchange our opinions, views, and all of us will keep in mind that there is still much to do in Russia-ASEAN relations, much to think about how to mitigate the rising conflicts, and uh, hopefully our talks will help us in, 
in certain regard as, as we can, as academicians, as students, as scholars. Thank you very much and uh, dear friends, hope to see you during our next uh, uh, meetings in, uh, in Gimor virtually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.